Bet Carr spent two decades as a Navy SEAL sniper. He's led assault and sniper teams through Afghanistan, Iraq, and beyond. This SEAL became a New York Times bestselling author when he rolled his real-world combat experience into an incredible thriller series. And today, I'm proud to have Jack join me to break down his long-distance shooting and to share his personal setup. When you read The Terminal List, True Believer, Savage Son, probably my favorite, or the new one, The Devil's Hand, you'll certainly connect with the lead character's journey. But you'll also come to realize just how much of a gearhead Jack Carr is. As I was first reading The Terminal List, I knew I had to get this guy on the show. Today, Jack is sharing his decades of experience as a long-distance shooter. We're going to discuss primary factors for ammunition selection, spotting scopes, wind meters and ballistic software, Jack's dope logs, and of course, Jack is going to show us his entire rifle setup. If that sounds awesome, it is. Even more awesome, this will not be Jack's last appearance on Gearbox Talk. So hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon, just to make sure you don't miss anything. All right, let's pull the trigger on this one. This is Gearbox Talk with the Jack Carr. Welcome to Gearbox Talk, man. How's it going? Dude, thank you so much for having me on. This is awesome. I always love talking gear, which you'll know if, uh, for those who have read the books, so they'll, they'll understand that. They're kind of, they're gear heavy and gear tells a story. So I love, I love talking gear. It's a, it's a Dude, part of who I am. Yeah. Love your books. And, and if anybody has read your books, they know that you have to be drawing upon something to pull all this knowledge around long distance shooting on. And I know you, like you kind of just said before we started recording here, I know you've been out of the game for a little bit, but I, I, people are going to be super pumped to see your setup for long distance shooting. And I'm excited to, to really be able to go into this. But before we start talking gear here, I really just wanted to ask you, what do you think is one of the biggest mistakes people make when they're getting into long distance shooting? I think it's that, that the barrier to entry is having to have this crazy understanding of ballistics and coefficient this and that and uh, buy something that's super crazy expensive with a crazy with a scope that's even more expensive uh, and, and all that sort of thing. So uh, I think it's that there are these barriers in place that uh, might seem like they exist if you were to do just a Google search on it. But uh, it's just being uh, discouraged out of the gate because there's so much information out there today. Uh, and you don't really know, just like with a lot of things, you don't know what to trust, who to trust, uh, or how to get going. So I, I think it's uh, that I think that's that there's this barrier there that doesn't exist. Yeah, I think if you're new, something you just said is part of it. Like you don't know who to trust, so you don't know who the authorities are, and you can end up on on platforms or, or websites that certainly overcomplicate things. And and today we're going to try to break down all of this really simple for for the person that's new to long distance shooting. And you know what, some of you veterans might learn a little something along the way too. So what is uh one of the primary thing? What's one of the primary things? to consider for your ammunition ammunition selection for long distance shooting that your rifle likes it um so rather than just buying x rifle x uh x box of ammo uh with this these scope rings and this glass um it's if you're starting from zero uh actually i would say that the most important thing is to go to a school first um, where you're going to learn these things so you're not going to make a mistake out of the gate and be like Ugh, why did i do that once you have the more information. Um, so if you have a certain amount of dollars to invest in this, I would invest it in uh, the school part of it. So you're either going to, uh, there's some great schools out there now. My experience happens to be with Thunder Ranch for the most part in Oregon with Clint Smith or FTW Ranch down in Texas. There are other great ones as well, but uh, but those are the two that uh, that I've, I've been to multiple times uh, and can recommend because I've, I've been to them. Um, so if I was gonna just start I would go to one of those schools and call them and say, hey, can I borrow a rifle? Do you guys do that? Uh, and if one does, then I would go there. And while you're there in that class, now you're talking to people that have been doing this for years. In many cases, that is their only job is to know rifle, scope, ammo combinations. Uh, and then for just in the conversations you have during class and in many cases after over a drink or something, uh, you're learning more about the culture. You're learning more about the options and you're learning, hey, this isn't as, a, as intimidating as it might've seemed online when I saw these crazy pictures and scopes and all this expensive stuff pop up. So I'd say initially, that's where I would start if I was like a, a sniper school in the military, um, you're going to school and then you're getting this 
this weapon. You're going to school, you're getting given a certain rifle, you're going through a certain course of instruction with that rifle, you're getting another one, you're building, but it's part of a school. It's not, you just, they just don't hand you the, the rifle and say, go forth and do good things. So for me, I would say invest that in that training part, uh, maybe with a rifle that they have to lend you at first. So then you can make better decisions and choices as to what gear you need for your particular application. I love that answer. It's a great answer on, uh, you know, kind of a different way to think about that. And it's certainly not something that's going to be common to, to uh, other content you might be seeing out there. Let's talk a little bit about your setup. What's your, uh, I know you got a couple on hand here. Um, let's look at what you got on hand for your long, long distance shooting setup. Yep. So I have a few things, but this one, I, when you said to grab something and I'll scoop back a tiny bit, so you can see the full thing. So I figured I would grab the rifle that I grab more often than not when I'm hunting these days. And this is a, a rifle zinc. It's a 300 Winchester Magnum and which is the rifle that was the workhorse for the SEAL team snipers when I was in. Uh, we do see a lot of different um, calibers now and we did at the time too. They just added to that arsenal. But uh, but this is what I what I grab more from that because I like the lightness uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. If you look at pictures on Instagram of me at the beginning of the war and then later on, you'll see that uh, I've slimmed down and that's just not from running and working out. Uh, that is gear wise. So getting a little more mobile, moving in and out of vehicles, in and out of helicopters, in and out of windows, over compound walls, that sort of thing. So slimming down was very important um, and going as light as possible. And people that have spent time in the backcountry know how important that is to uh, to shave those pounds, shave those ounces uh, down. So this is a very light rifle, uh, but you don't need some, this is a very expensive rifle, but uh, you don't need an expensive <laughs> rifle. I want to make sure that people understand that, uh, that you can get the job done with something that's uh, that's not not custom. It's just right out of the box. There's so many great companies out there. Just throw some good glass on uh, and, you'll, and you're, you're good to go after you understand your reticle scope rifle ammo combination which you'll understand a lot quicker and a lot more in depth if you go to one of those <laughs> but uh yeah i put good glass on swarovski on there this is the, the z6i right here um I, but for the last 10 years uh, i want to say maybe just maybe just just shy of 10 years uh this is what i have taken out uh more often than not so super light great glass uh i get uh, a dope card with it so i can shoot by dialing or by holds in this reticle. And each reticle can be different. Uh, there's choices out there, but once again, going to that, going to those schools will uh, will will cue you in on the, what's gonna work best for you. So you have options. I was gonna ask how you're logging your, your dope. So can you can you talk through that for a newbie that has no idea what you're talking about? Yep. So uh, so we were just talking earlier about how you can uh, go back and you can find some Instagram pages that show people going out in the 1940s with jeans and cotton base <laughs> layers and uh, red flannel shirts and coming back to, you know, either a, a bolt action 30 out six or a lever action 30, 30 and, uh, and, and getting the job done. Uh, so you don't need all this crazy gear to, uh, to go do it. But uh, for this one, this has a hunter zero meaning that it's set and depending on which rifle it is, it's usually either 200 yards, 250 yards. That's probably the average. So I know that if something pops up at 50, 100, 150, uh, 178, uh, you know, 200, 215, 200, 300, I'm good with whatever, with that dope that is in there. I don't need to dial. I don't need to think about it. That's it now. Each rifle caliber, everything else is going to be different. But then if we start getting over that, if I get over that 300, uh, uh, yard uh, mark for the target, well, I'm going to dial or I'm going to hold based off my reticle. So uh, that's typically how I do it. So this card tells me, and I have two of these typically for each rifle. Uh, one goes here uh, on this particular setup. Uh, the other one will be in my pocket or in my pack somewhere else. So I always have a backup of a picture of it on my phone as well. Uh, so, I, so I have this and I can go, okay, 700 yards. Okay. Uh, this many clicks. Okay. Got it. Boom. Uh, it has some wind information on here, that sort of thing as well. It reminds me what ammo this rifle likes. Cause once you have more than one, it can get confusing, especially if you have a lot of different rifles. Yeah. Is it the 165 grain or the 180 <laughs> grain that this one liked? Uh, I can't remember. And it might not make a difference at 250 or a hundred, but you know, if you're taking a shot uh, pretty far out there, then, then it could what, make it. what is your preferred for the, for this particular rifle? This is 165, I think. Uh, so, so 160, actually, this is for the other rifle behind me, but uh, 165, oh, here we go. There it is right there in front of me. 165 grain TSX, which is what I thought. So yeah, yeah, 165 grain for this one. Uh, and then the card that I had in my hand, which is for a different rifle, 
that I'll hold up here and give people a little bit. Yeah, so I say we saw your old faithful. What's your other setup you got here? Yeah, so this is a little newer, and I like this uh, from Sig uh, because this this stock. How's oh, that a cross? Up. Yep. Right here is the new is the new cross, and this is six point five Creedmoor, and so this one likes uh, Sig one thirty grain CET ammo. So it tells me on this card, and it was just right there. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see. Or if you see on the screen, so it tells me exactly. So I have all these Elvis, Elvis Ammo on the shelf. They're like, ah, I forget which one this was. Oh, it tells me on this card here. Okay, the 130 grain. Boom. Yeah. Check. So I get that and I go. So this is for this rifle. It has uh, it has my name on it. Has the rifle on it. Has the ammo on it. Has all the dope on it right there. So uh, that'll go with this rifle. So uh, I wanted to keep this one all Sig. So I put some Sig glass on here and uh 6.5 creedmoor uh of course it has a magazine right there and it's super light and pretty affordable and you can fold this thing up i really like you can fold this thing up and put it in uh in a backpack or yeah in your or whatever really else. cool feature uh, yeah so uh put a bipod on this one uh typically my hunting rifles don't don't have that but when i'm sighting them in then i put a bipod on there just to get the get the sight in down so that's this one it looks cool too what, what I'm going to ask you a off the cuff question here. Um, for hunters, the six, five creep more is like either the greatest gift or it takes so much flack. What's your, what's your take on why that is? I hear a lot of people, uh, beating it up, but I'm, I'm kind of curious from you as, as someone who has a ton of shooting experience, you obviously selected that. Can you talk through some of that uh, criticism you often hear? Yeah. So I, I chose it because I didn't have one, uh, in 6.5 yet. Uh, my daughter did, I got her one in, uh, uh, 6.5 Grendel, um, which is a little, little different, but, uh, I wanted a rifle in 6.5 for that reason. I had friends that took this round to Africa and, uh, I just slayed it with, uh, uh, with planes game in particular. So it's, 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 and it's all shot placement. I mean, mm -hmm. Uh, but for me, I grew up essentially in the SEAL teams with the 301 mag. So I'm very comfortable with that round. I know it just intuitively by shooting it so much. I haven't shot uh, a 6.5 as much because it's my first one. But uh, so I don't know it as well off the cuff. I just don't have that relationship built with it like I do with a 301 mag. Um, but yeah, you know, if, if you get shot with this in the chest or with a 301 mag in the chest, like you don't want to be, you don't want to be shot by either. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> Shot placement. That's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, was, you you talked about your um, your, your three hundred Win Mag. The what what are the primary differences between that and what you were using when you're an active sniper? Or like, are there any really between that, or is it the glass, or um, is that pretty much your setup? Yeah, no, there, there, there are choices here now that I'm in the private sector. So uh, in the military side of the house, uh, you didn't have that many choices, particularly when it came to uh, to the rounds. Mm -hmm. You had more choice with the 5.56 rounds than we did with the with the 300 Win Mag rounds. Um, but uh, so you were given a round, you were given a rifle, and you're having scope rings and scope. Uh, and we started with loophole scopes, uh, the Mark IVs, which are on this right here. So this, I had this made when I left team five uh kind of harkens back to some of the uh it's a it's a running to model 700 but it's uh you know i kind of wanted one of those old school type rifles this is the the uh the scope that we used back then before we switched over to the uh to the night force but uh uh yeah you were just given you didn't have a choice yeah. so i think that's the big the big difference is i like, we didn't put much thought into all the options because there weren't there weren't any you had a certain tool and you learned to use that tool and you got used to what it what it could do you learned its uh capabilities and more importantly its limitations uh and your limitations with that weapon system uh which is almost more important than just knowing the capabilities um so both those things uh i think are, are probably the most important things for people to understand about their chosen rifle uh its capabilities and limitations and your capabilities and limitations with that. And by going to one of these schools, you're shooting 50 yards out to 1500. And it's not that you're going to take a shot on an elk at 1500, but it's just so you get to know that round a little better in different conditions. And so when you go to take that 200 yard, that 250 yard shot at an elk, that 100 yard shot at an elk, you are so comfortable because you hit steel at 2200 yards uh with it in some cases depending on your setup so uh it's just really uh something that teaches you what you can do to give you that uh that to give you that uh, confidence in uh what you can do 
with your chosen weapon system when you're a lot closer. Yeah, archery, it reminds me of archery very much the same way. You know, you shoot yeah. out to 60, 70 yards to tighten up your, your 30 to 40 yard shot. You know, it makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, the, the, the closer distances are a little bit more forgiving, but you learn some discipline at that long distance. Um, and you can apply that at the shorter ranges. Hey, uh, to kind of pivot here um, into a different piece of gear, but I'm sure is vital to your setup. What kind of spotting scope are you using, you know, in your civilian life these days when you're out just you know, kind of practice shooting yourself? Yeah. So I have the, I usually, I, buy, I borrowed friends up until this point, actually. <laughs> I'm lucky to have friends that have the Swarovski setups. Uh, I think there's two, uh, there are two main ones that Swarovski has, and I couldn't tell you off the top of my head because I don't own them yet, but they're on my, on my short list. So I have a, I don't have it in here, but I have this new SIG spotting scope out there. Um, and I haven't had a chance to take it out and really put it through the paces yet. Uh, just because I'm so kind of in tune with the Swarovski stuff. And, uh, and I like that, uh, in the SEAL teams, we had, uh, loophole stuff, um, or for, for the most part, I think we had a few other things as well. Cause you could do off the shelf purchases for things that weren't programmed items. Okay. Now we're getting a little geeky. Yeah. Uh, on that side of the house, but uh, but yeah, it's really the most the the quote unquote best glass that I can afford. That's what I'm gonna go with. Um, but on the other side, you don't need the Swarovski crazy setup to get the job done. Like you can get it done. All the glass, all the big name glass companies now are so good. Like everybody is like you know. There's n I can't think of one that's not good. If you know the name, you've heard it before. Uh, yeah. And they probably have a good, some, a good at least one line is going to be good out of all their um, uh, out of all their offerings. So uh, the glass companies have come so far in the last 20 years. They're all they're all good stuff these days from from my experience anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, m most people I've talked to on this show and just in, in general say that really during the day, they're all the same. It's it, that last. 15 last minutes. Light. Yeah. That last light. Is important. Where, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which it is important. Hey, I shot my, my deer this year. Uh, I got my buck at last light. Um, there's a lot of activity happens at last light, but, but if you're, I, I guess I bring that up because if you're not using it for hunting and you're going to be just generally uh, shooting, like my co-founder Zach is really into long distance shooting, but I don't think he's is interested in hunting. Is that something to factor if, if you're looking at pricing on, cause glass can get expensive really quickly. Um, so if, if that is the case that it's all during the day, you know, really, you're not having as much differences. It seems like that'd be something to factor that maybe you don't need that last light performance. Yeah, maybe I'm more of a, uh, I'm definitely a glass snob. I was going to say, I'm asking the gear yeah, guy if he should take any wrong, shortcuts. <laughs> wrong, I'm going to be like, yeah. Uh, so, so for me, that's why I'm, I'm, uh, I'm waiting to get the Swarovski set up, but, uh, you know, I, if you can get it done, you can totally get it done with anything else. That's just me. Uh, me you know i just have a, no I, have a I i just had um some buddies on the show we talked about bear hunting and bear hunting relies so much on your glass and and those guys both said the same thing of you know if you're putting your money into anything put it into good glass um because because like, kind of like you said about the rounds like you can get it done elsewhere a lot of different ways but if you don't have good glass then then it's just going to make a huge difference in your hunt so yep. uh, sounds like it sounds like you're kind of in agreement there and the show i'm talking about um we did just launch. If you want to check that out, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. That's with Cody Rich and James Nash, who also shoot that nice. uh, that SIG spotting scope that we were just talking about too. Uh, he, he vouched yeah. for that. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So I, I want to uh, shift over to kind of talking about the wind. You know, there's so much technology out there today uh, mm -hmm. for reading wind, but I'm kind of curious on your approach and, and how you set it up and then maybe your recommendation for a newbie. Yep. So the wind is tough. So when I went through sniper school, it was an art. Uh, so I went through sniper school in 2000 and what we learned was typically based on the experience of guys in Vietnam. Um, we're using the same type of rifles, which were essentially hunting rifles, painted camouflage. Um, and there wasn't really a revolution in technology behind uh, sniper and sniper weapon systems until September 11th, until we started getting that experience on the battlefield, uh, shooting at altitudes, uh, across canyons, in snow, you know, cold weathers, that, and then in Iraq and Basra and hot you know, Najaf, summer, uh, that sort of thing. So we started to evolve and guys came back and they started uh, debriefing and writing up lessons learned and figuring, hey, what this is what I wish I had had there. If only I had had this, uh, more guys started going to SHOT Show and going on into the private sector and seeing what long range shooters were doing uh, in the private sector, what they were using, why they were using it. Hey, can we adapt this uh, for, for military purposes? Uh, that sort of thing. So there was, it really took 
September 11th and going downrange to war for tactics, techniques, procedures around sniper weapon systems and tactics uh, and gear to change and to evolve. So now I'm dated on, on all of that. So I've been out for a few few years now and I can only imagine what they're doing now, because as I was leaving, uh, you know, we're shooting other things. We're shooting 338 Lapuas. We're doing uh, the Accuracy International stuff. You have Schmidt Meter scopes uh, coming out, I think, on a few things. Uh, of course, we have lasers on on our uh, on our rifles as well. Uh, we have auto loading weapon systems. We still have bolt action uh, weapon systems. Uh, a, a lot of the P we have per these these PDAs that are now attached to the scopes that are talking to each other, and we have wind, you know, the Kestrel meters and all that stuff. So there's just a lot more information for guys to apply to that shot um whereas i tend to be because of how i came up in it still more of the art type of person just reading that wind down range hey what's it doing here at the muzzle at the at my end of my barrel and then what is it doing down there near my target uh is it swirling down there is it going the opposite direction of what it's doing up here what are the trees doing what are the leaves doing are there any other indicators out there that i can look at uh to give me more information to tell me where to hold as i take this shot so uh so mine's more of that now Good today. skill to have, as I've read in Savage <laughs> Sun, I think, you know, when, sometimes that technology right. goes out on you. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. So it's like, what's well, more my, uh, my personal uh, experience applied <laughs> to a fictional narrative. But, uh, but guys today, yeah, very, um, uh, get, get very technical, very scientific about the science versus the art. Uh, and of course there is a, an overlap there and probably the best snipers are, uh, have the ability to do both, uh, the capability to do both, understanding of both. Um, and then of course they have to know what happens when this thing stops, go, when this goes down, when the wind meter doesn't work, when their PDA doesn't work, uh, that sort of thing. Um, if something happens quickly, hey, back when I was in, everything was dialed. Um, and now um, we probably missed quite a few shots because we didn't understand uh, exactly how to hold with our reticles. And our reticles didn't really lend themselves to be able to do uh, holds very well. Now there's some great reticles out there that allow you to, to do holds very quickly uh, as well and change from a close shot to a long shot without looking at your scope and dialing and counting those clicks. So, so things have definitely evolved out there and that's, but Hey, once again, that stuff, you don't need to, that, that, that might be a little too tactical. You might just need that, that rifle that's sighted in at hundred, 150, 200, 250, whatever that is. And you know, Hey, I'm not taking a shot over 300 yards of this thing. Or you know what? I'm if it's a if it's a if it's a really windy day and it's coming in from uh, from right to left. Uh, hey, I can still make a shot at 100 yards. Uh, but you know what I can't do? I can't make a shot at 300 yards uh, where I could if there was no wind. So that's the part that's important to understand uh, as a hunter and as a shooter, so you can make that ethical shot. Are you using any kind of, uh, like you kind of talked, I don't know where your art stops with your, your tooling and, and what you would recommend to like, um, do you use any wind meters or ballistic software today? Or are you still kind of leaning on more of your own personal judgment? I have a uh, ballistic software that I think I did not update with my new phone. So I, so I've, <laughs> I've used ballistic software, uh, in these different shooting schools. Uh, I've, so I've, I've, I've used that. I've done the calculations and all that sort of thing. But as soon as I get home, I get out on the field. Uh, I, I don't do that. I, yeah. uh, I go back to, to what I know, um, which is that rifle, that round, uh, how to hold, how to look at that, that wind and where to hold in that wind, depending on which rifle I'm using uh, before I take the shot. But uh, more so, it's just about understanding those capabilities and limitations. Um that's all the questions I have, but I do want to wrap up with one last question on this one. What is your number one advice for somebody that's trying to get a long distance shooting and think they're interested into it? Uh, and this may be some summary of what you've kind of said, but I'm just kind of curious on that take home advice. What's the, the one piece of advice for somebody that's getting into long distance shooting? Yeah, it's to go to sign up for one of these courses and get out there and do it. Um, if you think you're, you want to do it, um, then this is your year. Get out there and make it a priority and get out there and do it. Um, you know, there's not, there's in the way of prep, it's just that mindset It's put, it's signing up. It's putting that date on the calendar. It's blocking it off and it's getting out there, there to do it. Now, of course you can teach yourself, you know, online, probably you can go on YouTube probably, uh, and do it. But I like to, I like to go to learn from someone in person whose only job in life uh, and whose passion in life is understanding these things and then teaching that, um, to others. So, um, so I just like that interaction. 
get out there and do it would probably be the tagline of Gearbox Talk, man. So many people at the end of the day just tell you like, stop thinking about it and just go try it. Go try it. Go try it. Go try it. That was the that was the last show I recorded. That was the the take home advice there. So uh, I think that's awesome. Uh, awesome advice. If you have not checked out Jack's books, I don't know what you're thinking. You got to go do that right now. Um, they are fantastic audio books. They're great uh, physical books. However you like to read, go get his books. Jack, where can they find your books and where can they find you on social media? Yep. So officialjackcar.com. And if you go back in the blog section to the earlier posts, there are some articles there on some of the weapons that I used downrange. So the Mark 12, um, Mark 11, uh, sniper weapon systems, that sort of thing. So you can go and do a little more of a deep dive than you'll get from the novels in some of those earlier earlier posts. Uh, so you can find me there and then on the social channels at Jack Carr USA. And I'm uh, most active on Instagram and Twitter on those. Awesome. And we have another interview with Jack Carr. He's on our Restless Native podcast. I don't know exactly how the timing's going to work out, but make sure you subscribe to Restless, Restless Native so you don't miss that show. Jack, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you so much for having me. Let's do it again soon. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jack, for doing the show. Reminder, Gearbox Talk is a product of Go Wild. If you have not downloaded the Go Wild app, please correct this right now. You can join literally hundreds of thousands of people who are posting about shooting, hunting, fishing, and more. More things that you like to do outdoors. The social media app is available in all the app stores, and I'll put a link in the show notes. Now, I have to say, Jack Carr is literally one of the most humble people I've ever had on any podcast, either this one or my other show, Restless Native. He was actually grateful for me allowing him to be on my show. Meanwhile, the New York Times bestselling author who has literally been on like Joe Rogan, he's, I walked in a bookstore the other day and he was on the cover of, I think, three or four different magazines. This guy is the real deal, but he's so down to earth. You have to appreciate that. And not only that, I have to say thank you to Jack and all of our audience who have served this great country. Reminder, all of the gear Jack mentioned is in the show notes. All purchases through these links help us raise money for a camp that teaches kids to shoot, hunt, fish. Thank you for helping with this initiative and supporting the show and go wild. Thanks for watching. Until next week, I'm out. <laughs>